Hello and welcome to another episode of Around the World in 80 Teas. My name is Sharon Hall and I'm the Chief Executive of the UK Tea and Infusions Association. Today we're talking about tea from Kenya with my co-host Will Battle and our guests Sebastian Michaelis and Robin Harrison. Will Battle of Fine Tea Merchants, a UK-based wholesaler, has 25 years of experience in the tea industry. He's also the author of the World Tea Encyclopedia. Sebastian Michaelis is head of tea at Tata Consumer Products Limited. He oversees the sourcing and quality control of tea for the Tetley Tea brand. A tea taster and buyer by trade, he started within Tata as a graduate trainee, and he has managed buying from all major origins, blending and new product development for the past 15 years. And finally, Robin Harrison is a director of Thomson Lloyd and Newitt, the world's oldest tea broker established in 1760. He has been tasting, marketing and selling teas from all over the world his entire working life, with a particular focus on Central and East African teas. He had the privilege of being the final auctioneer at the London Tea Auctions, which came to an end in 1998 after a 319 year history. Will, Seb and Robin, welcome to the podcast. And you may not realize that Kenya is the world's biggest exporter of tea. And most of the black tea blends that you have in your cupboard at home are likely to have tea from Kenya within them. Today, we are going to explore why. I'll hand over to Will to start the discussion. So we're talking about uh, Kenyan tea in general today. Um, but Robin, perhaps you can give us a sense of where in Kenya tea is cultivated? So tea is grown um, in both sides of the Rift Valley in Kenya. So right down the middle of Kenya, the, the, the Great Rift Valley of Africa. And the, you have the east of Rift um, region and the west of Rift region, where tea is cultivated and produced on, on both sides of the valley. The, the, the east of Rift region of Kenya um, is slightly higher. It's, it's, they're all about six or 7,000 feet above sea level. And basically they're on the slopes of Mount Kenya, the southern and eastern slopes of Mount Kenya and the western, the, sorry, the eastern slopes of the Aberdare mountain range. And then when you cross the, the Rift Valley, you descend from Nairobi, which is about 5,000 feet above sea level. You descend to the valley floor at about 1,000 or 2,000 feet. And then you climb up the other side to the west of Rift region um, where uh, the main corporate growers are, are as well. The, the, the big uh, tea, tea plantation, tea estates are there um, uh, alongside you know, a, a whole host of smallholder production as well. The main tea in the Easter Rift is smallholder tea uh, with only a few large plantation or estates around the Nairobi region. So that's where tea is grown, the east and west um, um, of the Great Rift Valley of Africa. Fantastic, thanks Robin. We'll get into perhaps what differences we might expect between teas east and west of the Rift a bit later, but perhaps Seb, you can paint a picture of what it's actually like um, in a tea growing um, district in Kenya. What, what are we seeing if we're, if we're standing there? Sure, yeah, I mean, first of all to say it, that they are stunning places to visit. And if, if anyone has an opportunity to see a tea estate, I really encourage you to do so. And Kenya's a prime example of, of really beautiful tea estates. It's, um, Robin was describing the elevation there and uh, six, 7,000 plus feet, which is 2,000 meters or thereabouts. So you'd expect it to be quite mountainous, but actually the, um, it, it's very, um, it's hilly, um, but like very rolling hills. So it's, um, it's, there's no, the only peaks I suppose you'd see on the Easter Rift with Mount Kenya, but generally where tea has grown is quite rolling hills, um, very lush, uh, green tea leaf is, is very bright and vivid so especially during the, the growing seasons it's it's a very um, lush looking place um, and interestingly the climate um, Kenya you always think of uh, being an equatorial country very hot but because of that higher elevation it's very temperate so you get lots of lots of sunshine um, but the temperatures can actually be quite cool it's almost comparable to the UK um, at times if you don't bring a fleece with you at night time it can be quite chilly um, but they have the benefit of, of more sunshine so it's a very um, yeah, rolling hills um, uh, very lush green um, fields of tea and interspersed with with forests 
uh, some of it timber used in the tea industry and others, uh, the natural forests, uh, like, the, like the Mao forests in, um, in central Kenya. That's fantastic. Thanks, Sarah. That's a great picture you paint. I have to say that your point about altitude is one that I hadn't picked up until I, my first trip um, to the west of Rift areas. And I took myself on an early morning run. And um, I remember being absolutely exhausted after only about four or five minutes. And then I was overtaken by a girl carrying her, hers and her little brother's school books. And she's wearing flip flops. Um, and that, <laughs> that was me panting. Um, wearing all of my lycra and uh, yeah it's only then that you really realize quite how high up you are um, but um, as you say a beautiful environment um, so if we if we then sort of think about the teas and Rob, robin i'll put this to you what what would be the main differences between the teas that you find west of the rift valley and those in the east of rift um, areas so the teas from the east of the rift uh, are primarily smallholder tea so you're getting farmers who have an average size of maybe one acre or two acres of tea. And um, they go for very fine plucking. So literally the top two leaves in a bud um, are, are harvested by hand. And uh, they are then, you know, collected and taken to the, to the local tea, fa uh, tea factory where they're manufactured. But they produce this beautiful, incredibly bright, golden um, cup of tea uh, that with milk, because most African teas are drunk with milk. Um, uh, and it comes out really, really shiny bright, like a, it's like a sort of um, <clears throat> a, 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 a ray of sunshine. And um, they're very brisk, very bright, and have this lovely floral flavor, um, particularly from certain factories that are you know, nestling in the foothills of Mount Kenya. Um, the teas in the west of the rift, um, particularly the plantation teas, the estate teas, um, <clears throat> which more often than not are harvested by machine these days rather than hand plucked, uh, produce a slightly redder tea or more orange tea than this, than this golden yellow tea that you get east of the rift. Um, so that is the main difference. Um, the teas have strength and briskness, we say in the tea trade, that there's astringent or and the raspy on the tongue, and um, they're incredibly uh, um, enlivening and and refreshing. So yeah, it's quite unique that you get this this sort of very very bright brisk tea um, uh, from from East Africa, from Kenya in particular, um, and neighbouring Rwanda and and Burundi produce similar types of very very bright flavoury teas. That's quite unique, and you can't get that sort of tea from the Asian continent, and that's what's made them so popular. Well, perhaps Seb, you can answer this. Why would would you drink it on its own, or would you use it in a blend, or what what would you do with a, um, uh, particularly an East of Rift um, Kenyan tea? Sure, I mean you can actually do both. Um, and my my, I'm not just saying this for the podcast, but my favourite tea to drink at home is a. Uh, uh, East of Rift Kenyan tea, and I will drink it straight as is. Um, it's I think what Robin was describing is is th th these terms like briskness, um, which is a tricky thing to translate. But but essentially, it's um, there's uh, it packs a lot of flavour, um, and there's that astringency can dry the side of the mouth, which sounds a bit like a negative trait. But actually, if it, Kenyan teas are produced in the right way, it just has that right amount of of impact when you're drinking it, um, but not too much that it, it it leaves your mouth, you know, too dry and it's too too bitter. Um, so Kenyan tea, uh, I think we've already covered, was is is the biggest exporter in the world and uh, is actually constitutes the majority of the teas that you'll find in the UK market um, because it really lends itself to your typical UK consumer who's looking for a builder's brew. You know, something strong, gutsy, um, you know, something which can, you know, pick you up in the morning. Uh, so you, it obviously works well with milk. Um, but yeah, as a, as a tea for blending, it's, it's perfect because it, it, it lifts it up. It gives that astringency. But then you can, it can complement it with um, other flavors, like, for, for instance, from Sri Lanka, where you have more floral notes, um, slightly lighter, 
which can round it off, or Sam teas, which add the body to it, although Kenyan teas have a, a fair amount of body as well. But it, it, either is possible. It just depends, I suppose, on what, what you're in the mood for, what you're used to. Um, but as I say, for me, I, I, I love drinking um, East of Rift, um, especially Orthodox teas, but I imagine we'll um, talk about that a bit later as well. Yeah, can you, or perhaps you can go into it now. What can you just quickly explain for us the difference between you've just been talking about um, CTC? Perhaps you could quickly explain the difference between CTC and Orthodox tea, because then we can think about um, think about the question. Sure, uh, as quick. Well, I, I'm, I could talk about it for a while, but I'll try and make it as succinct as I can. Um, I mean, the process of of manufacturing tea, the, the CTC production is once you've plucked that leaf and allowed it to dry out a bit. You, you need to cut it up to be to use in either tea bags or loose, but to get it to the right size and shape that you need it to. And a CTC tea, it, which stands for cut, tear, curl, is essentially where you drop that leaf through two rollers with very sharp teeth in them that kind of interlock. And those 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 teeth have the action of cutting into quite small granular pieces, uh, which is what's used in a lot of tea bag blends because they have a large surface area, they can brew quickly, they give you that strength, the, the, the body um, as well. So it's, it's a very useful for that kind of flavor of tea, as opposed to an orthodox tea where um, the way that it's cut is it, through a machine that, that kind of uh, rolls it. Uh, so it cuts and rolls at the same time, but it produces what people would be more familiar with as loose leaf teas, larger leaf teas um, that don't brew as fast, um, can have some different nuances of flavor, but generally are a little bit less kind of stringent and strong. Um, so the, the main differences are that um, I suppose Orthodox lends itself more to blends where you wouldn't use milk. Um, you could drink as a black tea or with honey or, or lemon or whatever, as opposed to CTC, which is more that, that strength, that builder's brew type tea. Robin said that the smallholders pick the two leaves and a bud. I think it's important to communicate that it's high quality tea that ends up in your tea bag, as well as, um, you know, what is maybe used to make an orthodox tea, which could be slightly different in brewing qualities or taste. But your, the tea that you have in your tea bag is equally good tea. Absolutely. I mean, it's no, as we all know, an old wives tale. They, they say that the tea in the tea bag is sweepings from the factory floor. I don't know why that myth keeps on being <laughs> regenerated, but um, absolutely, the, the, the CTC, East of Rift Kenyas or West of Rift Kenya teas, um, are incredibly high quality. They're all, you know, the, the KTDA, which is a smallholder body, um, the Kenya Tea Development uh, Authority for, for to translate. Um, they 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 are in very insistent in getting the highest quality green leaf um, coming in from the field, and and so uh, they are then able to produce a beautiful high quality a CTC small leaf tea, which is m manufactured just for the tea bag. Uh, I mean, Kenya's largest market, in fact, is Pakistan. Um, who it's a loose tea market. I mean, there's tea bags, they're a, a pretty small percentage of the market, but they love this, the small leaf tea that they, they almost, they don't brew it like we do in Britain. Um, uh, they cook it. They literally, you know, they, they put, uh, have a saucepan over a flame and they'll put a, a required amount of black leaf, dry leaf in, in it, water and sugar, and milk all together, and they will then boil and cook that tea for the recommend, recommended amount of you know, five minutes. In fact, you'll find that they permanently have a saucepan on the boil all the time. Can you give us, so looking back, um, a little bit of a sort of sense of where Kenyan teas come from? Because it's not so long ago, Kenya wasn't so significant to the, um, the world tea. Um, so when, how, when did it all start? And um, why has Kenya become such a uh, global power in our industry? So tea was um, first planted in Africa, actually. For, funnily enough, Kenya wasn't the first country in Africa. It was Malawi in the late 19th century, 1895 or something. But in, in Kenya, um, as Kenya was founded um, in the, you know, around the 1900 to 1910, the first um, settlers came there. Um, tea was grown 
in and around Nairobi in a small way. So from very small base, they started. Uh, also, post First World War, there was a big movement um, for you know army army veterans out of the First World War uh, were encouraged to go to to Kenya uh, or Kenya, as it was known in those days, um, to go and plant tea, amongst other things. In fact, it was primarily it was flax. They 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 they, they just, you know learned that flax wouldn't grow very well in Kenya, so they they switched it to tea, and they brought sort of literally seeds from Assam um, and planted them, and um, there was you know the, the, the gave birth to the the Kenya tea industry. So during the 1920s and 1930s, that's when it all started, uh, and it slowly slowly planted out, but a, a fascinating. Um, statistic I came across the other day was um, in 1942, obviously when the Second World War came along, tea was rationed um, and um, Kenya produced um, six million kilos of tea in 1942. Um, and, and today, or, or last year, it produced an absolutely massive um, 570 million. So it's gone from 6 million kilos in 1942. And that is what, 80 years later, or 78 years later, it's gone up, you know, 6 million to 560 to 570 million. Let's put that in yeah. context, 570 million, that's enough to satisfy the entire British demand more than five yes. times, basically. Yes, so, so we consume, give or take, say 100 million kilos of tea. In, in, in the UK, um, and that slowly shrunk over a, a couple of generations, but there's still a, a huge market. Um, so yes, it could produce enough tea to fill, you know, five years worth of British consumption. Um, so it, it's, you know, and it's become today, as you alluded earlier, the world's largest tea exporter. Um, but what really gave the impetus to the growth of the, tea, the Kenya tea industry um, was the founding of uh, while it was still a British colony up until 1963, the founding of the, the, the Special Crops Authority, which was um, a government-sponsored um, program um, to encourage the local farmers in, 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 in Kenya to grow tea themselves, uh, rather than let the, sort of the big corporate companies grow huge, huge plantations of tea. So what started the first factory in 1959, I think it was Rogati factory, um, still going very strong today. Um, the, the government built this factory and they encouraged, and then they, they, they you know, dished out all the seedling plants to the, the local farmers and taught them how to grow tea and said, look, you grow it, we'll buy it and we'll manufacture it and we'll export it. Um, send it to the, the London tea auctions they were in those days for sale to what was the, the largest market in the world, which is the UK. Um, and from that has grown this, this really successful um, smallholder organization um, called the KTDA, Kenya Tea Development Authority. And um, it now has 79 tea factories um, and produces two thirds of, or let's say 60%, of Kenya's production. So two thirds of that massive 570 million kilos, well over 300 million kilos comes, comes from the smallholders. And the thing to remember about the smallholders is there's about 600 or 700,000 of them involved. Um, and they have an average farm of about one acre, um, uh, less than one hectare. So, so, but the extraordinary thing is if you can mention little plots of one acres everywhere. You would think it would be a sort of uh, a patchwork quilt. But actually, if you fly over um, these smallholder farms in on the Easter Rift in Kenya, it is exactly the same as flying over a tea estate because they are all planted contiguous to each other. And so there may be 200 farms right next door to each other of an acre each. And it looks like one enormous tea estate. Uh, but they're all harvested by individual families uh, and, and the leaf, you know, delivered to the local factory. So um, you know, it's, it's fascinating how Kenya has grown, has grown from nothing to, to the, you know, to dominate world exports. And, um, and the tragedy in my mind is that actually you ask a person in the street, 
did you know Kenya, uh, tea comes from Kenya? And most of them will say, no, I didn't. I thought tea was grown in China or India. Um, and, you know, somehow we need to get the name of Kenya out there um, as, as producers of really fine quality tea. Well, it's interesting, Seb, Seb mentioned earlier, and I thought this, that's interesting, and actually, Seb, you're not unique in this. You ask a lot of tea tasters secretly what they have in their cupboard when they're making themselves something at breakfast. And for a lot of people, it is a, uh, an Easter Rift Kenyan tea because it's reliably excellent quality tea, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, the more you do tea tasting, the more you kind of get used to having stronger and stronger flavours. So you kind of you seek out those those kinds of uh, characteristics. And I think Kenya has got I mean, it, it, it does have a, a very broad range of, of gardens and you do actually get differences in, in flavours across Kenya. But but by and large, they all they all kind of benefit from that elevation, um, those uh, volcanic soils. Um, and and a perfect climate really for producing tea. So I think they've got Kenya's got everything going for it. Hence why it's grown to the extent that it has. Um, and just to add to to um, Robin's remarks about the, the the uniqueness of the amount of smallholders are involved in production. I mean it it provides um, an excellent level of quality control because of of the attention to detail of the of plucking of two leaves in a bud. Uh, but also Kenya has invested a lot in in different cultivars of, of tea. They've got a lot of money they've put into researching new varieties of types of, of tea. Um, and if you look at, you can still find some old fields of, of the tea that was originally planted a hundred years ago. And it looks like a completely different plant than what they're planting out now. You know, these old older leaves are much smaller, darker green and these newer varieties um, much wider leaves and they grow faster because it's the part of the reason for the growth in the volume in Kenya is these new plants can just produce a lot more and they grow faster and and they're more um, hardy against things like droughts so there's there's a difference in the quality coming through from the research they put in the amount of money because it's such a huge part of the the Kenyan economy. So can you just go into a, just a little bit of detail for um, for the benefit of people who are not perhaps familiar with what what's good about plucking two leaves into bud um why wouldn't you pluck three leaves into bud and, and what where uh, why, why does the quality come from plucking two leaves into bud sure um i mean without I, i'm not a scientist so i won't go i, <laughs> I couldn't claim to know um, all, all of the details but but essentially tea um if people aren't familiar as long as the conditions are correct you can pluck a leaf um today and you can go back to that to that same plant anywhere between seven and 14 days later and, and repluck again um, so it's not a an annual harvest it's something that continuously you can you can harvest um, and the the growth if you go to a tea estate i should say in kenya you'll notice one thing is that all the bushes are very flat so there's that's what they call the table because what's, what happens is the pluckers will come along, or if there's mechanical harvesting, they've got um, these small handheld machines, um, and they will just obviously try and take off just the new shoots that are coming off the top. So it kind of maintains this very um, uh, yeah, flat looking visual field. Um, and essentially that new growth is where the, the, the chemicals are being um, within the plant like that give it the flavor are being concentrated is where the plant is investing because of that new growth to trying to reach the sun, you know, <laughs> in very basic terms. So the older the leaf, um, the, the harder it will become, it will grow larger, but it will be shielded, it, often it will be shielded from the sun. So it won't have that same exposure. So really it's, it's, it's the succulent part of the bush that's coming through. Um, and that's where you get that, that flavor. And it tends to be the further you pluck down, um, the, 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 the lower that taste quality will go, it will become flatter, softer um, in tasting terms. Uh, and you can really tell if from a poor quality, from a good quality tea because of that. So it, is, it makes a huge difference um, how far down you pluck. Um, and yeah, it, it's really about the concentration um, of um, catkins, uh, the, the chemicals that sit within the leaf. So they, they'll give us give us the, the nice taste that comes from um, yeah. the leaves into bud. Brilliant. But but saying that, it, it's uh, just to add, it's um, you can start with a brilliant leaf uh, and make a very poor tea. 
So it's, you know, whenever we mm. talk about tea production, it's a whole process. And really it's, uh, I think Taste has often used the analogy of, of a chef, um, the factory manager who's processing that leaf needs to get the right combination of making sure it's not been withered for too long or too short, um, making sure the oxidation process has been done at the right um, uh, length of time, making sure that the oven is at the right temperature. So all these combinations of things are critical to being able to produce a really good quality tea. So you can start with great ingredients, but still ruin it uh, or mm. produce a, a, a fantastic tea. And more often than not, the Kenyans uh, tea industry, very, very um, professional. So a lot of, you know, what they produce is excellent quality because they've been doing it for a long time. So one of the things that um, I suppose um, might be unique in our series for Kenya is that it's on the equator um, and um, we don't have the same seasonality as in some of the other origins that um, we've been talking about. Or, or am I right, Robin, do you, still, do you still get a little bit of seasonality in, in Kenya? Yes, there is some seasonality. I mean, because Kenya is on the equator, tea is produced 12 months of the year. Uh, unlike in, in, in North India, you know, there's only produced nine months of the year, let's say. Um, so, but you get rainy seasons and dry seasons in Kenya. So you get two main rainy seasons in the year, the short rains and the long rains. Um, so the long rains have just started in Kenya. They're generally mid-March to the end of June. Um, and then the short rains are generally mid-October to mid-December. Uh, and then you get the traditional dry periods of, you know, Jan, Feb, March, and then again, July and August and September. Uh, and so you can get different flavor profiles during this dry season compared to the wet season. Um, so, um, yes, and buyers, often a lot of buyers out there looking for, waiting for the February production from Imenti because, you know, they know it's, it's, it's dry, um, but there's still enough water in the ground. It's perfect sunshine. You know what your ideal, um, you know, and, and the, the dry weather will always slow the growth down. And it's that slow growth, that two leaves and a bud, that gives you that fantastic quality that uh, these these Kenyan teas can provide. Um, so yes, there is there is seasonality, but not to the extent, say, in, in North India. Um, or, or Sri Lanka, but uh, yeah, it, it, but they, they do have a unique flavor that you, it's a floral sort of zinginess that um, is quite difficult to replicate in other parts of the world, I find. Um, I mean, each of those wonderful regions have their unique flavor notes, you know, an uva, uh, you know, an uva uh, um, salon tea will be unreplaceable, uh, won't it? Um, or, or, a, or a sort of early June, late May, a Sam second flush. If you um, then look at what they're doing in the, in the factories or getting the, the tea, the green leaf from the field to the factory um, and thinking specifically about the smallholders, are they doing anything different or better to look after the leaf to make sure you've got um, uh, better quality um, in the finished product? That one to you, Robin. Um, yes, they have very good um, farmer field schools, they call them in Kenya. Um, you know, the, the, the sort of umbrella organization that, that, that runs all these, you know, um, 79 smallholder tea factories. Um, th they will be there to help the farmers, you know, th right through the whole process of cultivation uh, and, and harvesting and leaf collection and, and you know, what they look for, you know, they, they, they insist on, you know, they, they will turn away poorly plucked leaf. Seb, um, Robin talked about seasonality and, and you man mentioned planting of drought resistant varieties. Are we seeing a shift in those seasons because of climate change and, and how is the tea industry adapting to that? Well, it's like anything with climate change, you can't always attribute one weather event to climate change itself. But Kenya has been identified as one of the more vulnerable countries to climate change uh, due to its due to its locate various factors, I suppose. And these short rains, long rains that Robin mentioned are critical to not just um, the harvesting of tea, but but all food that's produced in Kenya. And 
what we have seen, if you uh, uh, look at graphs over the last 10 or 15 years, is there's definitely more volatility. So um, we have had several droughts uh, in the past few years, which uh, generally have hit around January, February time when it tends to be a bit drier. But yeah, the, the main issue there is um, that that consistency of the weather isn't as as there anymore. You used to be able to say that long rains would arrive on the 14th of March and it was, you know, within a day. Um, and now it's quite, well, you've had a few number of years where it's come several weeks later. So there's definitely less um, predictability. And there has been some actually work done on um, forecasting how climate change will impact the tea industry. And generally what, it, what they expect will happen is as the climate gets hotter, the area suitable for cultivating tea will, will get higher and higher. So you'll have to go to high elevations to, to produce tea or tea of good quality. That means some of the lower lying regions may find it more difficult or there may not be enough rainfall, uh, which could benefit east of Rift because it's slightly higher elevation and, and not so good for west of Rift. Uh, so it's, and in terms of what they're doing about it, so um, Robin mentioned these farmer field schools, actually there's a lot of work within those, um, those structures of, of teaching farmers how to um, cultivate tea is what they can do to mitigate those impacts and one thing simple things actually like um, putting shade trees uh, on, on, on your plot of land so which is exactly what it sounds like to, to actually reduce the temperature of the air by having trees that can uh, block the sun a bit more um, the cultivars which you've mentioned uh, which are more drought resistant so there are a number of factors that that will allow them to adapt but you know it's it is a it's a big risk and it's, it's a big worry for the farmers and for the industry as a whole. So yeah, we're very, everyone's very conscious of it, working hard to do what we can. Um, but, um, but like everyone, climate changes, we just don't know where it will, where it will land. Seb, can you talk us uh, through purple tea? What, uh, what is it? So purple tea is a, a specially developed cultivar of tea that was, um, I think it was the original story was essentially it was discovered. It was a random mutation that they'd found in a tea plant. You know, as, as often you do, you find a tea plant that has a specific attribute to it, um, whether it's fast growing or whatever. And what was distinctive about it was the look of the leaf, because obviously tea leaves are green um, and these leaves were very purple, um, which sounds very odd. Um, I wouldn't say they're purple. Um, uh, to the extent like a, like a felt tip pen, but, but there's definitely a really strong uh, purple hue to it. And it's a concentration of chemicals of that, that give a tea that flavor um, within the leaf. And those chemicals uh, which, are, which are in the leaf are, have been attributed. It's difficult to say that there's definite health benefits, but there's a, definitely this kind of a lot of um, uh, aura of are these chemicals full of antioxidants, which may be beneficial. Um, it's a question mark over that, but essentially the Kenyan tea industry has seen it as an opportunity and have, have planted out um, purple tea um, because it has this unique attribute to it, not just the colour, but, but the amount of antioxidants that are in it and how it can be used. It, it has got a very distinct flavour. Um, uh, astringent is, is, is the word I would use. Um, drinking it as a normal tea is actually quite you know, it does, it has a real drying of the mouth, um, but it may have uh, applications in uh, ready to drink. So bottles, you know, where you have an element of tea in it, like an iced tea that's been packaged. So um, yeah, it's really interesting because it's a new innovation. Uh, I say new, it's, it's a, little, a few years old now, but it's, it's where the tea is, tea is trying to expand into new areas uh, rather than just being what you expect black tea in a teacup. So um, yeah, there's lots of applications that tea can go into, and I think purple teas are, yeah, be interesting to see um, how it's used. Kenya, because it's grown so fast, they've been very aware that they should also try and diversify away from traditional black CTC tea. And uh, I know you alluded earlier to the orthodox tea. Um, I mean, actually, purple tea is made, it can be made either as a CTC or as an orthodox tea, but there are now you know, quite a lot of factories in Kenya, both in the smallholder sector and in the plantation sector, as it were, that produce orthodox tea and very good orthodox tea as well. And uh, they think they need to diversify their markets um, a little bit, which is, which is very sensible. But they are competing head on with Sri Lanka uh, and India and Indonesia in a traditional black orthodox producers. 
Um, but they, they, they find a niche in, in various markets. And the quality is also, because it's from the same KCDA, small older factories that produces high quality CTCT, you know, those, you know, out of 79, only at the moment, 10 factories out of 79 have the ability to produce orthodox tea as well as CTC. But those factories are, you know, do produce a lovely floral orthodox tea, light, light in, lighter in cup without that body, but they're, they're, they, have, they have beautiful flavour. Yeah, I, I, I like this sort of biscuity, um, beautiful biscuity taste I've, I've had on some of those orthodox teas. Yes. Really seductive. And we've been talking on some of the other episodes about what foods the different teas go with. What would you all drink your Kenyan tea uh, with? Maybe start with Seb. Oh, good question. I mean, uh, Kenyan tea for me is first thing in the morning. So it is a breakfast tea through and through. In my mind, you know, it's it's something instead of a coffee, it's it's a real, you know, it's a punch to get me awake. So, yeah, it's a breakfast that, you know, has to be whether I mean, I, I don't tend to go for the full English in, in breakfast in the morning, but it tends to be more uh, cereals and things like that. But, um, yeah, I mean, it is it is a, a strong, you know, it's got that 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 punch to it. So it's it, for me, it's more about the time of day and it's 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 a morning tea. Um, what it complements, I'm not sure. Um, biscuits, yeah. <laughs> probably too many of them. <laughs> I would go for, um, yeah, breakfast, lunch and dinner. Actually, the Kenyan tea can be drunk at any time of day. So. Um, I'm with you, Robin. Definitely. Yes, yes. Um, but yes, honestly, it, it, it can. You, know, you, you can always have a uh, an orthodox for for uh, without milk in the, you know, in the afternoon, and a, and a, a punchy pick you up for first thing in the morning, and you know the same again in the evening. And and Will, we've we've learnt about your full fat milk habit. <laughs> Is it the same for you with Kenyan tea? Yeah, it it really. Any time of day you could have Kenyan tea. I think it's it's it really it will go brilliantly at breakfast. But you the orthodox Kenyans as well, you can have in and, and I've used them in afternoon blends as well. Um, so it really does work any time of day. And and it's such a useful tool in as a as a form of blender, it's such a useful tool in your armory because it's it's beautiful golden colour allows the blend to shine. So you can also put it in with other teas, which might taste great but they don't have that brightness and it makes the tea look beautiful at the end so mm. it, it works so well on so many levels. So Robin just to, to wrap up onto another subject you were the last auctioneer at the London Tea Auctions can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes it, uh, it, it took place in June 1998 um, after a a, a fairly unbroken stretch of 319 years. Um, I think the Second World War was the only time that actually the tea auctions didn't happen. Um, and f I, I was fortunate that uh, I, I was an auctioneer for Thompson's then. And uh, actually, I loved auctioneering. It's, it's, they say the best training for a tea auctioneer is amateur dramatics. And I've done that all my life as well. Um, so it's like being on stage and you have your audience and, and you, you, you learn the patter and, um, and it was great fun. Um, and you know, for, 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 for economic reasons, the, 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 you know, London was a terminal market. So it came, came to a close. Um, basically, um, there wasn't, you know, big buyers said they couldn't concentrate on lots of different markets all the time. Um, Actually, Kenya, it was the case today themselves, the smaller themselves, in 1998, they had a really bad drought and they said, I'm really sorry, we don't have enough tea to send to you in London for sale. And what, what, what the reduced amount we have here, we have to put into the local market. Um, yeah. So that, that, that was the sort of uh, the first signal that, um, uh, anyway, it was, you know, it had to come, the world changes. Um, you know, and, and it came, came to an end in, in 1998. But it, there was a little charity auction at the very end and the very final lot. So producers around the world donated small parcels of tea for, for sale and the proceeds all went to a, a tea trade charity. The final lot, we actually took a chest of um, a flowery broken orange pecker. Oh, look, there it is. 
<laughs> that's the catalog, yes. We took one chest um, of a Hellbodder flowery broken orange peco, FBOP, from Sri Lanka, from Ceylon, and put it actually next to me on the, on the, the dais, the auctioneer's dais. And um, the bidding started um, you know, at five pounds a kilo, I think it was. And the whole world, and there were phone bidding, and there's everybody in the room, everybody from the from the big the big packers and blenders were there. Um, and eventually it, it came right down at about 250 pounds a kilo. Up to that level, everybody was bidding. And uh, and then from about from 250 pounds a kilo upwards, it was just between uh, Jonathan Wild of Taylor's. He's, he was the managing director of Taylor's of Harrogate then and John Leader, who was the tea director of Twinings then, um, they were fighting it out over about 15 minutes. I remember this, this whole lot, one lot took 20 minutes to sell. And it was between the two of them and they were going up and up and up. And eventually it, I knocked the hammer down at 555 pounds a kilo. But there's the, there was an irony on this little story at the end. Um, the, the, the Chester tea, um, had only 36 kilos in it. Now, for some reason, um, I had made a mistake and in the catalog was printed 40 kilos rather than 36 kilos. Um, and therefore, when you score, what they call scoring in a tea auction, is working out how much you spent and what your average price is. Um, the assistant to John Leader at Twinings, uh, you know, he said, right, we, we can spend up to 25,000 pounds for this chest of tea. Um, and he was doing his scoring and, and, and eventually ran out of money at 555 pounds a kilo. And, and so Jonathan Wilder Taylor's won it at 555. But only afterwards did, 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 did we discover this mistake of the four kilos that it, it, it transpired that Twinings' limit actually could have, could have gone up to about 700 pounds. If, if the, the, the correct amount of kilos had been published in the catalog. Anyway, because um, uh, I, I only found that because when I invoiced Taylor's for the tea, he said, you, you've um, invoiced me too much. It's actually only 36 kilos and not 40 kilos. But anyway, he got a lot more than 25,000 pounds worth of publicity out of that. And, and I think they still have that chest of tea in their boardroom in Harrogate. Well, uh, thank you to all of you for joining us on this podcast today around the world in 80 Ts. Thank you to our guests, Seb and Robin, and to my co-hosts, Will Battle. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.